Then we go to Mr. Olav Lundstøl. He is um, he currently works as a counselor and country economist uh, at the Royal Nor uh, Norwegian Embassy in uh, Tanzania. Uh, he has 14 years of development economist work experience in Africa, Latin America and Asia. He has worked for UNDP and for the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Lundstor's main field is extractive resource revenue management. And he is going to give us some examples from Zambia and Tanzania. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I will, uh, I will talk, as was announced, I will talk a bit in general on Africa uh, in terms of resource revenue management. And then I will also narrow in a bit more on the two countries I have worked more in detail on the last seven years, namely Zambia and Tanzania. And it will be a lot of it focused on mining and minerals, but also to some extent petroleum and extractives, and a little bit also towards the end on, uh, on uh, renewable resources, because there are a lot of commonalities, but also some important <coughs> differences. I will try to, uh, to discuss four questions mainly. I mean, the first one will be a bit uh, dwelling a little bit on what is sustainable non-renewable non resource revenue management and why does it matter? Explaining a bit why is it sort of some different principles and some things that are important to keep in mind when we talk about these resources as compared to other resources. Second one, what could indicate fair benefit sharing for government in the case of non-renewable resources? A lot of discussions on fairness and benefit sharing. I'll try to use some concrete examples and some attempts of benchmarking in the recent paper I'm working on. Uh, and then third question, what are some key characteristics of effective res resource revenue management? Some of this has been discussed to some extent in terms of principles, but I, I, I will repeat a bit on that and perhaps go a bit more into detail on some elements. And then specifically, as I mentioned, why is the regulation of gemstone and forestry that I will look at in, in, in the case of the two countries I know the best, in many parts of Africa, a bit of a disaster currently. So I will start out on the first question, looking a bit more into why when we talk about non-renewables, and when we are talking about assets, rents and wealth, why is this important? Because the production of oil, gas and minerals represents a transformation of an asset that is already in the ground, really into a financial asset. And depending on the resource prices and the extraction cost levels, the economic rent that comes out of that extraction in principle belongs to the country. So if this rent is not efficiently captured through tax or, or ownership or state interest, um, saved and invested, genuine national wealth could actually be diminishing. And I will look at some trends in some data that has been published by the World Bank. Uh, by Hamilton and Lay specifically, that find that adjusted national savings and genuine wealth turned actually negative on average for sub-Saharan Africa, right when we talk about the resource boom in terms of when the global prices for minerals and petroleum uh, went up very strongly. And uh, to avoid reduction in genuine national wealth, Africa needs to, one, capture a larger share of the resource rent, two, invest that share more effectively to increase productivity and national wealth. I mentioned that I had some data here that I would refer to, and you can see there's a very clear trend. The two other trends, the, the upper trend is showing Asia, and the one in the middle is Latin America. And you can see there, there are also ups and downs and different trends. But clearly in Africa, the one on sub-Saharan Africa, the trend is very, is very negative and right in the middle of the resource boom when you would expect actually that the countries would be in a position to, to increase their national wealth. Quite the opposite is actually happening when you look at the adjusted numbers. And a lot of the discussion why this is important and the rationale why we talk about these issues is that, of course, also I work for, for an aid agency. We provide large amounts of aid to Africa and other regions as well. So the rationale for aid to Africa and to other developing regions has always been lack of capital for investment and consumption. That is why you see that this is an issue. And you see that compared with Asia, for example, rates of savings and investment in successful Asian countries, for example, were already 35 to 40% of GDP as early on as in the mid-60s. 
uh, and they have in recent years are even higher. In Africa, the numbers have been typically between 15 to 25 percent, so a big gap. And this is part of the rationale for the importance of providing uh, development aid. But also with long periods of larger gaps between gross domestic savings, gross national savings and gross investment, explained and filled in important way by aid, building up of foreign debt, but also to some extent foreign investment. In the last decade, the gross national saving has increased in many countries in, in uh, Africa. For example, Tanzania that I'm working on now, it has gone up from 18 to 25 percent, so quite a positive trend. Gross investment even more from 17 to 32 percent of GDP, which is a fairly high number. But a big part of this, as I have in the brackets here, is increased from increased deficit in the current account. So not so positive on that side. Um, still also when it comes to the need for capital in Africa, I mean we can see that credit to private sector in Africa on the average is still only 10 to 20 percent of GDP, whereas in Asia and in low middle income countries in general it is about 40 percent, so uh, more than double. You also have the issue of very low levels of formal financial inclusion. In Tanzania for example only 70 percent of adult population um, are, are formally included in the financial sector and very low market capitalization. So you have only 5% of GDP in Tanzania currently, compared with 66% of GDP in low middle income country. So there's a huge gap here in terms of the role that uh, the investment sector and, and, and the, the formal capital can play. And also importantly, in the situation where we have actually now empirical evidence that the profitability of investing in Africa is actually very high. There have been some recent research at Oxford at the Center for Study of African Economies that show that on average the return to investment in Africa is actually higher than in many Asian countries and in many Latin American countries. So the issue is not so much that it's not opportunity but there are a lot of barriers that will come back to to some extent. Uh, and last five to three to five years, growing budget de deficit, significant external and domestic debt ac accumulation. This is a bit unknown, I think, to some extent, but actually at the current rate, Tanzania will be back to pre hippic debt level by 2016, so only in four years. Despite that there is a positive trend in terms of increased tax revenues, tax revenues last decade has gone up from 10 to 16% of GDP equivalent, so there's a positive movement. Uh, and we see also, interestingly, a very strong increase in estimates of illicit financial flows. Some, f some speakers earlier talked about this. Uh, and increasingly, as I mentioned, negative adjusted national savings in Africa last decade. Despite, or is this to some extent linked to and correlated to the resource boom onset and possibly also increased aid? That is a question that some researchers have looked into to some extent. Uh, it's an interesting question and uh, it's still a bit open for discussion, I think. The second question is on, um, on uh, looking at a bit in terms of what, what is a fair share. When we talk about benefit sharing, when we talk about the distribution of the gains, what are we really talking about? We all know that there has a resource boom been ongoing, especially since uh, mid-2000 to date. If you look at IMF Regional Economic Outlook for 2012, they have on average um, data that shows an increase by 250 to 300 percent in real terms uh, over the last decade. Uh, you also have a report from PricewaterhouseCoopers from 2011 that uh, is very much showing that the game has changed in the mining industry. You have a 32 percent increase to 400 billion in terms of revenue, net profits up by 156 percent uh, to 110 billion. Uh, and, and you see that in many sub-Saharan African countries, natural resources are very important. They deliver 15% of output on paper and 50% of export in total. Uh, and to some extent there is some evidence, according to IMF also, that uh, the resource curse effects might be diminishing. The last decade they have looked at, actually if you look at output growth, which is one of the things was referred earlier, that is also part of the resource curse, that, that uh, link seemed to have gone down and, and somehow disappeared in the last decade according to the, their recent report. Uh, but is that the case? I mean the resource curse are many things. So in the same report they also very much emphasize that you have a sharper dualistic economic structure emerging in resource rich Africa. So you have, despite high economic growth in many countries, you have 
a very stagnant situation where a big part of the population are still living in the rural areas. They are still involved in subs subsistence agriculture to a big extent, where the income level is very low and where you have as, a, as an effect of this, uh, a sort of a de-link between what drives up the economic growth and part of the economy uh, and, and what for the, the main part of the population is the actual situation. So you have a slow structural transformation compared with what you saw in Asia and to some extent in Latin America in similar periods of development. You have a very stagnant score on poverty in many of the countries, including Zambia and Tanzania where I work. Uh, very little happening despite 15 years of very high growth rates of 6 to 7 percent. You have fairly, fairly dismal performance on some social and environment indicators as well, although on some of the education and health indicators there have been big progress because of higher investment from the state side. But still it is a very mixed picture in terms of looking at the resource curves and the effect of these increased revenues. Here are some, some data from a paper I'm working on where I'm trying to sort of compare over time. This is over a period of 14 years where I'm trying to look at the situation of... Uh, the starting point is that when you have a resource-rich country, you would expect on average because of the, of the occurrence of, re of resource rent in these sectors that their contribution to, to, uh, to GDP, if you compare that with the contribution to overall domestic revenue, uh, you, you should on average at least find a match such that the contribution to GDP should, should not be significantly higher than what they contribute to the domestic revenue. Now, if you look at the data here, I'm just chosen some countries here, you find uh, a, a big variation. And for some countries also, I've included the, the, the export ratio to GDP because the national accounts are not reliable. And in some cases, more extreme than others. But on, in general, this is a massive problem in, in Africa that many of you are aware of. Uh, but on average, you can see that three sort of success stories that many associate, like Norway on the petroleum, Chile on the copper mining, and Botswana on the diamond mining, you see that on average the mining tax contribution to domestic revenue is higher than the, the mining value added or the, or the net contribution to the national accounts. But then you compare that with the situation for some of the, some of the mining countries uh, that I have looked specifically at. If you look at, for example, South Africa, the, the contribution to GDP is 8.3%, but the tax contribution to domestic is only 23 so only only one-fourth of what you would expect if you would expect this one-to-one, -one, which you could even argue that it should be higher than one-to-one -one because on average the rent, and especially in, the, in this period where you have very high prices, it should be significantly higher. And you see some countries like Botswana where it is very much higher. Uh, of course, you are comparing a bit between different, so the price of diamond and the cost of extracting is different, but still some of that is adjusted for when you, when you look at the relations and these ratios in the way I have done here. And then a little exercise that I've been doing to try to benchmark what if, in the case of Zambia, you used the experience of Chile in this 14-year-old uh, 14 period, what if uh, Zambia would, would have the same proportions between the contribution to GDP and the contribution to domestic revenue? Not, not, not using the same statistics as Chile, but just the relationships, the ratios. What would it mean over this 14 period? And you can see the impact would be massive. Uh, specifically, also you see the shift happens from around where the mineral prices go up massively, and that is around in the case of copper here. 2003, it starts going up. And you see for the recent years, you have a difference of uh, of uh, close to or more than a billion dollars that Zambia should have received in uh, in adjusted or or um, yeah ad adjusted mining or tax revenue if they would have been able to have the same proportions as Chile, as Chile have. Um, so over this 14-year period, the difference the difference is very very large. It is uh, more than four billion in total. Similar exercise for Tanzania. Obviously there the exercise perhaps can be questioned a bit more because we're talking about gold and in the case of Chile it's copper. But still you see for some recent years the difference is fairly large. It's 
it's uh, for 211 you can see that the difference is is um, is more than 250 million that sh they should have received in extra revenue and as a total is also a very big number that we are talking about here so a little exercise of trying to benchmark is is interesting because often these exercises and differences are not made very frequently i mean we have done them to some extent with frian in zambia and also in tanzania and it's very interesting you can also use more exact modeling where you put in the financial statements and you get very interesting results uh, now a little bit talking about what about the principles and the characteristics of successful regulatory systems what what are some of them and what are some of the experiences um, and then there's a very interesting recent imf report again that looks at fiscal regimes across extractive industries published in august this year that for the first time actually has some real empirics on this imf often doesn't public the, doesn't publish that they focus on the theoretical first best, sometimes second best, if you are lucky, in terms of what should happen and how should the tax system work. Very often they do not publish what the actuals, what has actually happened. But here they have actually tried to look at that. So uh, what they found, this is across not just Africa, but across the developing world. They found that on average, the cal when you calculate the economic rent, in the case of mining, the government is able to capture one third of the economic rent, on average. And in the case of petroleum, the average varies, the average is around two thirds or slightly higher. And for many countries, it's, it's above 80%. And I would assume also for many mining countries, it's significantly lower than, than one third. So you can see there is, there is a very disproportionate relationship here. And, and my overall claim, and I have been, I'm trying to do some research on this, is that mining is very different from petroleum when it comes to the ability to secure uh, fair benefit sharing and to have a, a reasonable government take. There is a very bad history and a bad uh, culture in the mining industry and the way it is regulated. It's very backward, it's very old fashioned, and they are not used to paying tax. I mean, o obviously, as you, as I've been said earlier, also petroleum industry, no one wants to pay tax, but it's more established also that, that the companies are supposed to pay. Uh, some sort of tax and at a certain level. In mining industry that is definitely not the case. Um, so, so what are some characteristics? Most of the successful countries have a mix of robust taxation and direct indirect state interest in the sector. So, um, and again some of the three examples I talked about earlier, Chile, Botswana and Norway, all, all have an important mix of this. In the case of Norway that many of you know better than I do as well, the average in the last five years of the contribution from uh, state direct financial interest has been 37%. For Botswana, they don't have it uh, disaggregated, but my guess would be that it's also at least 30%, maybe close to 40%. In the case of Chile, for many years, the main contribution to the, to the treasury and the revenue came from Codelco, the state-owned company. For many, many years, there was almost zero tax contribution from the large companies. Um, but then, of course, the question and the challenge and what IMF will tell you when you talk about this, not so much these days, it's changing a bit, but is that nationalization and state interest has often not been effectively introduced nor effectively managed in Africa, which is true as well. It has been a disaster in many countries. Uh, and close associations with resource curse channels such as patronage and rent seeking that uh, speakers talked about earlier. But still, it is a bit of a paradox to see that where it has actually the government has been able to take out the decent share of the gains, this is normally associated with strong interest in the sector. Um, and then fiscal design and administration in resources. There are many things that are important to, to uh, keep in mind here. And I think one of the problems often with the advice we give and the thinking we have from uh, the donor side sometimes when we come in and also from World Bank IMF is that there's no link between sort of design of tax policy and direct financial interest and the associated complexity of the administration of government take. Norway also in the case of petroleum moved up through different instruments and different mixes uh, as they developed their capacity in the administration to manage them effectively. So you had in the beginning more sort of a front-loaded system where you could take out some minimum gains earlier on through royalty, for example, and then you moved more towards uh, profit-based taxation. 
And there are important areas of control that the government and the, the country needs to focus on. How to balance, I mean, how to have control on production, price and cost. There, there are things that can be done, also like Frian and uh, others talked about, where you can directly intervene and put things in the legislation or in the contracts uh, that can sort of put some of these things to the side, including derivatives, for example, like we did in Zambia and it also being, being discussed in other countries. Take it out of the equation, take it off the table, and then you can have a different base for taxation and a different base for handling the complexity. But you need to have also elements of, prog or of progressive rates. I mean, if you have a resource boom, you need to have an ability to capture some of this profit that comes in as a possibility. So a mix of gross value base and profit base, you need to have linear capital de depreciation often is 100% write-off, creates a lot of problems in terms of estimating the tax base. Reference prices and cost, we have a reference norm price in Norway on oil. In mining, it virtually non-existent. This is something one can do also for some metals that where you have a lot of reference prices available. On costs, you could also introduce ways to sort of close the, the loopholes. De uh, derivatives I mentioned, and then also ring fencing that some people talked about earlier. Uh, also another thing that in oil most countries are moving away from is the issue of stabilization clauses. This is also when we moved, uh, when we worked in Zambia and now on Tanzania, this is a sort of a nightmare scenario where you have uh, a very difficult situation for changing contracts. And, and uh, of course the overall discussion now is to why not work more towards a concession system that you have often in the Western world on petroleum, where you refer to legislation and regulation and that, that can also be changed through the regular democratic processes rather than having, especially in a situation where you have weak bargaining or weak um, competency to be able to go into detailed negotiations of contracts of 100 or 150 pages, wh why do it? Why not take it out and, and have, have more the legislation and the regulation and then have very short contracts uh, and make the terms clear? It's a bit of a paradox actually and this is also would do a lot to, to uh, transparency because then there's no need to hide the contracts or to ask for the contracts. Yeah. It will all be there, clear for anyone to see. Uh, and then there's a lot of things that we have worked on when it comes to specialized tax administration, including audits. There's a lot of value and a lot of things to be said about that. You can get a lot of information through it, a lot of knowledge on the industry, and a much better understanding of how large enterprises operate. Um, also combined with technical audits. In many countries, for example in Zambia, it was a build-up on the ability on the tax administration to do proper audits, but you didn't have the technical audits. So then you have a bit of a problem. I mean, then you have a problem putting the puzzle together. So you need to move on both fronts. This is happening now in Tanzania on the gold sector. For example, you have something called Tanzania Mineral Audit Agency that are doing increasingly good work in that area working closely with the tax administration that is lagging a bit behind, but will now hopefully catch up. So when you get those two things together, it can help also to enforce and to understand the industry. And you can have important linkages to modeling. Again, Frian has been helping us as well on tax modeling. This is something very few countries in Africa have been doing systematically to have have proper tax models. So for example, why not have proper tax model on the mining and on the petroleum? and then use them, I mean use them, input the financial statement, use the knowledge you get so that when you sit with the mining companies, petroleum companies to negotiate or to look at the tax returns, to, to reach settlements or to reach, reach agreement, why not have a tool that where you can challenge, where you can put concrete evidence on table models that could be even better than theirs or at least on par to some extent, and then you can have a much better basis to get more revenue. It can be used again Friana has been helping us as well to do due diligence work. So many institutions can be involved and should be involved in the modeling work. Some are more that they get investment proposals. They can use these models to do due diligence and to benchmark and see whether the companies and the proposals are telling the truth or not. You can enhance risk management as well in terms of where you do audits and what you focus on. Then on the gemstone and forest, yeah, I will just have one slide on gemstone in Zambia. This is, as I said, is more of a disaster than actually large-scale mining and large-scale petroleum. This is really an, a sector that is it's close to criminal activity, I would say. I mean, in, after five years in Zambia, 
this is uh, no one really has a clue on exactly what is going on. There are thousands of licenses being given. Uh, there's no control on the government side, although they're trying. I mean, official estimates on gemstone export from Zambia vary typically between 30 to 50 million dollars per year. It is, has been documented by researchers at the university and also at the World Bank that probably we are talking about numbers at least from 500 million to 600 million. Uh, these are again also estimates that are not precise at all. And, and if, like Botswana is doing now, you could move further down into the value chain, you could probably talk about a value or an export industry that could be worth up to 6 billion per year. This is close to, I mean, copper mining at the moment is around 8 to 9 um, billion per year. So this could be a tremendous industry that could create jobs, that could create a lot of revenue, that is currently a, a wasted opportunity. And it's creating a lot of issues on the institutional quality, on the governance state of Zambia. And it's a, it's a problem throughout Africa. I mean, gemstone, the regulation, how you regulate gemstone mining throughout Africa in general is a disaster. I mean, there are Diamond mining in Botswana is one very good difference, but it's probably the only one that is regulated. Some countries are coming up and getting a bit more handle on it, but you need to definitely, you need to just regulate the industry differently. You need to give, you need to know the resource, you need to give out the licenses in a different way. You need to have larger companies involved, not thousands of small illegal or, or uh, illicit companies that are operating, and then you can enforce regulation in a different way. Similarly, on forestry, uh, Norway has been supporting some studies on this. We are active in the forest sector in Tanzania. On average, uh, this is often linked to non-tax revenue that looks at often renewable resources in terms of uh, revenue and fees that comes in. On average in Tanzania, the ta non-tax revenue has been only between 0.8 to 1.4% of GDP. Less than half the average of what has been the case in Sub-Saharan Africa from 2000 to 2005. This is considering that there's a lot of non-renewable resources and renewable resources in, in Tanzania. <laughs> and you look at some facts. I mean, timber export value only to China increased with 1,400% from 1997 to 2005. Statistics for all timber exports from Tanzania, however, from 2003 to 2005, was only one-fifth of the timber uh, import statistics if you looked at the China, the, the China trade statistics. So there's a massive gap. There's a massive gap in terms of how much is registered uh, and the accuracy of the statistics. More than 90% of timber in Tanzania is illegally harvested, meaning that it's taken out of areas where you don't have the management plans you are supposed to have and all the permits. And Norway has supported through the Auditor General there also work on this, and that found a measure of around 94% in terms of the overall timber harvest. In a survey conducted in southern uh, Tanzania in mid-2004, no revenue was collected for up to 96% of all timber harvesting. Sample districts that they looked at could have increased their total annual budgets fourfold if all potential timber revenue was collected. And then there was some estimate for those years, 2003-2004, that under collection just of the current forest royalties, which are also very low, quite modest, uh, if the under collection was of the range of up to 58 million US dollar that was lost uh, annually. Uh, and this is just looking at one form of taxation that is inefficient and low, but it just shows the, some of the scope of this. Yeah, and then to end up with some lessons. What are some lessons for emerging resource rich but poor developing countries? You have to, in general, make uh, quite a massive effort towards simplifying regulatory systems. There is, and this also comes to tax legislation and specialized regulation for extractive. There are often, you see that there is, a m there, that there is so many different fees, so many different taxes that intermittently undermine, un undermine actually the credibility of the tax collection overall and the efficiency. And you need to also develop much more specialized regulations. As Freon was saying, in many of the countries, you don't have specialized regulations. You don't have, even in the income tax legislation, sp dedicated uh, sections that go to the resources that make up such an important part of the economy. Um, again, ideally, why not move towards concession systems? Why not have simpler systems where you take out 
the whole problem linked to the negotiation. W why insist on the most complicated contracts when you don't have capacity, when you are bound to lose out on the negotiations? Of course, there are corruption issues and explanations of it, but there are some movements in, in Nigeria now. They are actually moving towards the concession systems on the, on the, on the latest licensing and on some, on some blocks. Uh, and then another second lesson is ensure a mix of state and private sector participation. Utilize actively field mine development plans. Seek to have several companies in each license block. This is again mining. It's backward, to be very honest. I mean, and first come, first serve. Anyone that shows up can get the license. No competition. I'm petroleum. Luckily enough, there is competition, although there are problems with how the contracts and licenses are awarded. But often you have some several companies involved. For example, Tanzania now on natural gas offshore, you have several companies involved in many of the blocks. Uh, and then also on the government side, use the development plans, use the, file, the, the field uh, plans to hold the companies um, accountable. Use them also to make sure that you optimize what they take out of the ground, such that you don't have a situation where they just have a short-term view and where you end up in a negative uh, situation for for the government. Uh, design robust government take regimes, so this also has to be regimes that are, can withstand both low and high prices and the same in terms of cost. Mines are different in terms of their profile and how much it costs to take out the similar on the petroleum and gas to some extent. Um, so you need to have a balance. When you're talking about low income country, you need also to have some revenue up front, but also not overstretch it such that you have you, you can also stimulate investment. And then consider developing specialized extractive industry tax modeling capacity. Again, I talked about it to facilitate the design of the policy and also not the least the enforcement. Uh, then there is a very important part on transparency. Many of the speakers have been mentioning this. You need to have transparency in the revenue flow and particularly often on the non-tax related government take. Often, for example, now in Tanzania, there is the big opportunity of the gas sector. A lot of the revenue will go to the national oil company, as is the case in many countries in Africa. Then you need to have clear rules and regulations on that that revenue actually will, you will ensure it ends up in the treasury and that it will be utilized in the right way. Uh, it's easier said than done, but at least if, if there's no rules and regulations or no system in place, you can be sure that it will be uh, difficult. And then, as Fian was mentioning also, expand transparency approaches to enable sharing of key information approved based for efficient taxation or real earning. This is also a big, big issue. There is some, some process in Tanzania now to try to, to look at the potential to implement the transparency guarantee. Could be the first country in the world if it does it. Apparently there have been some announcements recently and we had a, a mission in September that worked with the government on this. It's, it's uh, a possibility to introduce it linked to the fourth licensing round on petroleum. We are hopeful that this can go through and there are some signals from the, the Minister of Energy that, that they have accepted the idea. Uh, but in general this is a very important point. And then last point on regulatory approach to gemstone and forestry. As I mentioned, you need to sort of completely reform the approach, actually. I mean, the approach is faulty in many of the elements. You need to know the resource. Often there's no proper information on the resource. I mean, both in gemstone and forestry, and that is critical. I mean, we know this from mining and petroleum. You need to know more or less reasonable range, at least, what is the resource uh, to be able to regulate it. And then competitive rights to exploration and use. You need to have Ideally, auctionings, if it's possible, if not, at least some element of competition, not just handing out to anyone. And then increase the size of license unit or area to increase formality. This, I insist, it's the only countries in the region and in the world where Gemstone is working or where they are getting a fair share is where it's regulated with larger units and you can control what is happening. Look to Botswana. And, and the, le, the fourth point there, independent monitoring and audit, both on gemstone and also on forestry, you need independent agencies that come in and monitor and audit regularly. There have been some pilots on this. There are some countries in Africa that do it and Latin America and Asia, but it's not very common. And then also, why not also introduce modern tax and revenue collection systems? Most of the way that the revenue possibilities from this sector are regulated are still very backward. It's still based on 
very obscure fees or, or, or licenses that often the rate is too low and, and at least the way it is collected is, is not close to being efficient. Thank you very much. <laughs>